uh, thank you for the invitation. And those of you who are there, you think you can escape my terror, but you're wrong. I'm going to speak right here. <laughs> I brought my uh, thing to control it from far away. And uh, thank you for, and I love the word enabling. And uh, uh, hopefully I will uh, get across the point that uh, the tools we develop enabled uh, a problem people tried to solve for many years, but failed to do so. But I also want to give you a message that it is not the only tool. Oh, that it's solved. No, there are many other microfluidic approaches that could enable it to do even better. So it's only at the beginning of a very important and exciting application of microfluidics. And um, I'm never given a stereo talk. You know, it's like <laughs> I love it. That's it. And uh, yeah, focus one one. Um, the, uh, it's circulating tumor cells. Uh, that's what I'm going to talk about today. And uh, tumor cells circulate, believe it or not. Uh, and I want to tell a little bit about the history of that, where it comes from, and then uh, tell you why we want to uh, find those circulating tumor cells, and then tell you a little bit of how we did that, and uh, give you a little bit about the biology and the applications of that. It's, uh, before I do that, cancer is a pretty bad problem. And this slide, in my view, uh, tells you the extent of the issue uh, uh, that we are facing. In one in two men in their lifetime and one in three women in their lifetime will be diagnosed with cancer. That doesn't mean that they will die from cancer, but they will be diagnosed with cancer and they'll be treated for cancer. So it's a pretty daunting uh, number. About one quarter of all deaths in the United States today are because of cancer. And there are about 7 million people die from cancer across the world. And so it's not a, just a, a Western world disease, but actually 60% of all, all cancers are in uh, underdeveloped uh, countries. So it's a, it's a major problem. We all know that as we live longer, as we exercise less, and as we are uh, more overweight, uh, this thing gets you uh, more. And uh, so it is uh, an important problem. And it, the first definition of cancer goes back quite a bit. And uh, it is uh, 460 BC. Hippocrates uh, called it carcinos. Do you know why he called it carcinos? Uh, ca cancer, carcinos. Uh, because uh, it was a, uh, most of the cancer at the time, people didn't live very long. And those that diagnosed uh, were superficial cancers. This was a breast cancer patient. And it's called carcinos because he felt uh, that the shape and form of the cancer looked like a crab. And what a good number for being in Maryland, and you guys are the crab country. So, and, uh, so it is uh, uh, because of the shape, he called it carcinos. Thank God it, uh, it didn't look like a monkey, because if it looked like a monkey, it would have been Memo, and my nickname in Turkish is Memo. So that would have been terrible, and uh, thank God. And, uh, the other thing that uh, he did that is less known is actually he defined the disease processes into four boxes. And he called them humors. They were, uh, he defined them four humors. Uh, and uh, one of them is blood. Uh, one of them is uh, a mucus film. It's all the uh, mucus tuberculosis and diseases of that nature. Uh, blood, yellow bile, uh, jaundice, and uh, cholera, and others. And the fourth one is the black bile. And uh, he believed that the diseases occurred because of excess or lack of these four fluids. And uh, so it was spread all over. The, at the time, he knew that uh, these things were spread all over. And the worst one, the black bile, was uh, uh, given to two diseases. Of course, one is cancer. What's the other one? Depression or mental disorders. And in fact, black bile in Greek means melancholy and it comes from, and melon is black and koli is bile. And so they, they, there was, uh, even in the dynasty years in China, uh, they knew that cancer and uh, depression and mental uh, state uh, had a lot to do with each other. Today we know much more about that. And uh, so the importance of black bile is twofold. One is uh, it defines the source of the disease, but also it defines the recurrence of the disease because it's spread all over the body. And they didn't do surgery at the time for cancer because they felt that you couldn't remove it. It's all at the fluid. It's all around the body, which has changed much later. And, uh, and it changed because of the work of very famous uh, person, Vesalius, who uh, in many millennia later, uh, and uh, his work is the father of modern anatomy. 
and um, uh, he uh, until his time uh, it, Romans didn't want to uh, uh, prohibit it doing uh, dissection of human body so most information was coming from animals but with Vesalius they started doing human anatomy and he could he wanted to find the black bile he couldn't he found the other three bile but not the black one. So uh, it was very big disappointment because he was coming from that uh, uh, school of thought. And um, so the, decided that the black bile doesn't exist until 1849, a resident, young uh, uh, physician at Monash University in Australia published a one page paper in Australian Journal of Medicine that uh, showed that this was post-mortem uh, cancer patient, 36 year old uh, male, and uh, he showed that both in the primary tumor, the image you see on the uh, left, uh, as well as in blood circulation, the image you see on the left, there are three cells on the left that look like the primary cell. You can see the microscopy techniques were not very advanced at the time, but you can clearly see those three cells here and three cells there that are circulating tumor cells. That's the first known report of so-called black bile. The uh, tumor cells that are circulating in uh, peripheral uh, blood. And that has created a lot of interest uh, uh, for, uh, since then. And the, in the next 140 so years, what we know about the process is uh, in, in two slides, uh, 140 years. So number one, you don't die from primary tumor. You die because the cancer spreads. It's the metastatic process that kills brain, melanoma, and few minor cancers killed because of the primary tumor, but the reason why you die in cancer, it spreads, and the metastatic process is the hallmark of cancer. Nine out of 10 deaths is because of that in cancer. So seven million people, six, um, six million plus uh, die because of the spreading of the disease. So that's one thing. The other one is we know, of course, a lot more about the process, molecular process, biological process of metastasis today. As soon as the tumor that you see here, is a few hundred micron in size, it becomes vascularized. As soon as it's vascularized, the tumor cells slough off into the circulation. And, and so they, it's like a, a zip car system. They're trafficking within the peripheral circulation. They have zip codes, different tumors go to different parts of the body. The prostate goes to bone marrow, the other one goes to the lung, some goes to the brain. And they have a, a very orchestrated process. And we know a lot about the, uh, this process uh, today. The biggest challenge has been that these are extremely, extremely rare cells. And we believe and uh, that maybe in uh, a blood of cell, uh, tube of uh, uh, blood uh, in billions of cells, you have one uh, tumor cell. So it's a very rare event. To make it even more difficult, it is also like Ben & Jerry's ice cream. It comes in multiple different flavors. Some of these are mostly epithelial cells because most cancers are epithelial cancers. About 90% of all cancers start from the epithelial uh, cells in the uh, various organs. And uh, they are, uh, many of them are apoptotic. They are committing suicide because they don't like to be. When epithelial cells are detached from their environment, they don't like that the signals uh, kick in to, uh, for the cell to actually kill itself. And because they are not, uh, uh, if uh, it's like human beings, you guys are very comfortable all next to each other. If I take one of you, put in an isolated island, at some point it gets on you and you commit suicide. And these guys are exactly like that. Some of them are uh, proliferating. They are actually dividing. So some of them are dying, some of them are proliferating. They're a confused bunch. And some of them are transitioning from epithelial to mesenchymal. These guys don't make up their mind. And then some of them are stem cells, some of them are clusters. And it's very important to, I will show you some evidence of all of those uh, uh, from the technology we developed. If I take a tube of blood, this is what you do when you go to your physician's office. Those of you who are young and avoiding your doctor, uh, keep doing that. If I become a professor of surgery, you should not go to doctors. And. Uh, <laughs> It, <laughs> I'm not a surgeon, though. I'm just a professor of surgery. And 10 milliliters of blood has about 100 billion cells in it. So one tube of blood that you give when you go to your physician has about 80 billion, 100 billion. If you want to interrogate each one of these cells, and if I give you one second for each cell, you look at it, it's blood cell, blood cell. Oh, 
tumor cell, mm -hmm. put it there, blood cell. How long do you think it will take you to interrogate them? 3,740 some years. Uh, it's a very long time. And uh, I mean, yeah, even, yeah. <laughs> and so the technology I show you is actually going to interrogate these cells about 2 million cells per second. And uh, to be able to uh, do this in a reasonable time period so you can have a clinically useful information. But the process, high throughput process, uh, as uh, it was saying, the field of microfabrication, MAMS was going, it was more important to do things smaller and smaller and smaller. People were taking pride. Oh, I manipulated three nanoliters of fluid. The other one says, oh, mine is femtoliter. And there's a big fight over no you made. And we went backwards. We actually put a tube of blood. In fact, now we put three tubes of blood uh, through a microfluidic chip. And, uh, and they didn't think that we could do that because it will clog and all of those. Don't listen to them. It works. And I'll show you how it works. I won't go into details of this slide. It reviews the, uh, the field, uh, the way I would like to describe it. And this happens uh, in uh, uh, medicine a lot. When people have some exciting ideas, the first intention for physicians and the commercial entities to go off the shelf, whatever is available, tweak it and use it. So flow cytometry, magnetic bead sort, they've been extensively used for the last 50 years. They are not developed for rare cells. So they've uh, statistically finding rare cell with conditions that are distributed in those, uh, not well controlled in those kind of conditions, uh, are not feasible. And uh, so they fail to find it. And other groups uh, look into very biophysical parameters. And uh, big cells, small cells, you'll see that these cells have very wide range of, like I told you, it's uh, Ben and Jerry's ice cream. They come in different flavors, big ones, small ones, uh, fat ones, viscoelastic ones. And so they have not been able to find these cells. Typically, the, when we started this in 2007, so it's not a very long time, actually, and um, the field was 20 to 50 percent of metastatic patients, you find these cells, but you find one in a tube of blood. So clinically not very useful beyond prognosis. If you have five more cells, you're a breast cancer patient, your survival is five years. If you don't have those cells, your survival is 20 years. But it's not clinically actionable information. You, you need diagnostic information, you need therapeutic information, you need early screening. And the field said the biology of these cells are such that their black bile is not there. And uh, in numbers that is clinically useful. And since uh, we are uh, not a cancer biology group, we are not brainwashed with all those uh, dogmas that they have in the field, we said, no, this is a technology. You guys are using the wrong technology, off-the-shelf technology. It is a technology that you, have, you haven't used sensitive enough technologies to find these cells, and it's not a biology. So that was the real original hypothesis. We literally went back to uh, Blackboard, and um, in our microfluidic uh, lab. This is the only reason I'm showing this is that this is actually at Mass General Hospital and uh, our microfab. So we make many of our chips and then we outsource it. And uh, I've never understood why we have a garbage can in a clean room, but uh, I hope you guys have too. And, uh, but it is, uh, we make most of the features in our lab initially and then uh, we go to higher end laboratories. Uh, ours is a very standard uh, laboratory. Uh, the first chip we designed, I'll give you two flavors of the chip. And uh, we have more, but uh, just the two that we collected most of the useful data. And uh, we have three fundamental engineering parameters, design criteria. One, we said less is more. It's a very complex, you centrifuge, you FICO gradient, you will lose these cells. So we said less is more, single step, whole blood, goes through the chip, whatever it, the chip I will tell you in a minute, and you find it. So don't manipulate a rare cell too much, uh, you will lose it. Two, be gentle, because these cells are bombarded by complement, oxygen, uh, immune system, so they're not happy to be in blood. And uh, three, make it as uniform. That's where the mic power of microfluidics come. Because if you can make it very uniform, every one of those 100 billion cells interrogated the same way, statistically your ability to capture them is very high. And the way we did it in the first chip you see here is uh, it has these pillars. And, um, and it's about the size of a credit card. 
and you see me looking at the chip there, and that's the, uh, this is deep reactive ion etched, uh, the pillars onto the chip. The blood comes in from one side, flies through the thin uh, channel, uh, comes out at the other, and, uh, and there are about hundred thousands of these pillars that are about uh, one third the size of human hair. And here you see the scan and electron microscope of those pillars. And the pillars, I won't go into too much of the detail, uh, that they distribute in such a way that we break the streamlines and everything so that the ma we maximize the interaction of the rare cell with the pillar. As they go, they just touch the pillar. As they touch the pillar, we put a glue on the pillar. And then the cancer cell sticks to the pillar. Uh, the blood cells touches but goes out on the other end to the waste. And the glue we use, there are multiple different glues you can use. And I won't go again into much of the details, but uh, we uh, put the various antibodies on the surface. Most of the time we use EPCAM. EPCAM stands for epithelial cell adhesion molecule. As I told you, 90% of all cancers are epithelial, so it's a good marker. Blood cells don't have it, tumor cells have it. It's on the surface, it's an antigen. You have an antibody, oops, you capture it. But we use many different ones. We also use cocktails of antibodies as well. And I won't go into details of that. If you have questions, we could talk more about it. The next one, you will see the video clip of the experiment. It will give you a sense of how it works. The blood will come from your left. Whole blood will go out to this side, to the waist. You will not see blood because we didn't label the blood. But take my word, whole blood is going through the chip. We spike the tumor cells into the blood uh, that we've fluorescently labeled. So you will see the navigation of the tumor cells. And you can see how nicely, I told you we are gentle. And about shear stress, about one tenth of the physiological. We captured one there. And, uh, you know, this, oh, another one there. So bec because there are hundred thousands, there's f about 500 redundancy. So if they are not captured in one, they are captured in downtown. So we have many redundancy. Flow conditions are very predictable. And uh, once we did this, uh, we realized that we have cells that are on the order of 100-fold uh, uh, higher than what's reported in the literature. Suddenly, like a popcorn, we have started seeing these cells on the chip and um, uh, in the, from the patients. So that was the excitement. In other words, we tested the hypothesis, whether it's biology or the technology. And we showed that with a sensitive technology, you find more of these cells. The problem with this chip, it's very costly to produce. It's not transparent. We cannot see a lot of the flow conditions and cells. Pathologists don't like it because they want to do certain stainings that are only doable with transparent chip. So we have the next generation. We have built another one that we call it herringbone CTC chip. And um, not because, uh, uh, because there are certain herringbone patterns. You see it's plastic, roughly the same size. It's really the size of a glass slide. And uh, the way this one works, whole blood comes in. It has eight channels. And the top channel has a herringbone structure. There are no structures that goes through the thing, which is very difficult to make high aspect ratio uh, structures. It has this herringbone patterns that Whiteside's original did for microfluidic mixing. What that does is dump, it uh, tumbles the blood as it goes through, and the cells touch uh, top and bottom surface. So these this cells uh, jump over the streamlines. You create micro vortices. And we have optimized it uh, using imaging. Oh, this is Phyllis Frankel. Somebody was asking. Uh, this is a photograph by Phyllis Frankel of the chip and uh, actual chip itself, pseudo-colored. Eight channels. Eight channels. Blood comes in and goes through the channel. It's about 50 micron high, the channel. On top, there are these herringbone patterns that you see here, these little herringbone. There are about two thousands of these herringbone patterns. What the herringbone patterns does is the flow comes in, it, uh, it creates micro vortices because of the blood cells uh, don't sit in a streamline and come out at the other end without touching the top and bottom surface, but they are jumping up and down. And you can actually see the flow patterns in the, in the chip there. And uh, so that micro vortices create enough mixing as the blood goes through. And uh, statistically, uh, fluidly, uh, fluidic me fluid mechanics perspective, we calculated that you have enough 
interaction of all the cells with surfaces. So if you have a cell that has the right antigen, it sticks to the surface. Same principle as the, as the post, immunoaffinity, but the fluid flow of geometry is different. It's a little bit more sensitive, and it's transparent. It's easier to manufacture. Uh, that's, yeah. So this is how we captured the cell. And we have modeled it, uh, and I will skip that. And the, you see the scanning electron micrograph of the herringbone structure on top. It, it, critical dimension is 50 micron and 50 micron. So aspect ratio is one to one. We could I mean, injection mold or hot emboss this, and I'll show you uh, later on. So manufacturing wise, it's uh, uh, pennies. It's very cheap and uh, uh, transparent, and it works uh, uh, better than the expensive silicone chip. And uh, this is the way it works. The blood is in a, a vial. We don't touch it. Push through the chip itself. Uh, and, um, and then this is the waste. The cells are captured. And we have automated all the fixing and staining. After we capture the cells, we fix the uh, cells and stain it for uh, typically three different markers uh, with fluorescent uh, labeled to make sure that because there's any time you use antibody, there is a, a non-specific binding. So there are some leukocytes, uh, bystander cells that come along. They are like the cells uh, you throw a party. There are one guy you don't want to show up at the party, and they show up. Those are the leukocytes. They always show up. They come along to that party. And, um, and so we have done a whole fixing staining automation. So if you want to get to real clinical world, you better make the quality control automation. So it's not just publishing a paper. You really need to pay attention to all the details of how you quantify it. So we have also built the entire imaging platform that is automated that can find these cells, detect them, scan it, and uh, look at the size, intest, all kinds of features that we publish. I won't go into details. In the end, we find the black pile. And we color it so it's not black. The yellow one is a tumor cell, a, a green one is the tumor cell, red one is leukocyte. Three, a typical three markers we use is DAPI, which stains the nucleus of the cell, so we want to make sure it is a cell. That's the blue. In this case, we use green channel for a tumor marker. This is a, can, a lung cancer, I'm sorry, this is actually a prostate patient because we stained it for PSMA, which is prostate-specific membrane antigen. CD45 is common leukocyte antigen, so that's a leukocyte. So that's a white blood cell. That's a tumor cell right next to it. Uh, and uh, with these three markers, we can unambiguously determine whether it is uh, a tumor cell or a leukocyte. We are working, it is a very uh, complex uh, thing to f uh, quantitatively fix and stain cells. And uh, some markers work good, some patients respond better, so there is a lot of work that goes into uh, generating the few pictures I will show you in the next uh, several slides. So it's not an easy thing, oh, take an antibody, paint it, and it will work. There is. Uh, we do uh, run gels on these. We make sure that we have the band. We sequence it. We make sure what we see is what, uh, what it is. We look do a single cell PCR. So I'm not going to show any of those, but validating these and getting these pictures is not uh, enough. It's a lot of work in the background. Here is a cell from a breast cancer patient. This cell is dividing because we stained it with Chi-67. It stains the DNA that's proliferating so that uh, thing there, bright thing there, you see, that's a proliferating cell. So it's the same cell, you can see uh, one cell and it's proliferating. This is in a breast cancer, it's in the blood circulation of the pa patient. Here's another breast cancer patient. We caught this cell as it is actually splitting into two cells. And you can see a leukocyte here. This is one cell, the nucleus split into two nuclei, and this one is organized. This one is still scattered, the one on the, your right. And uh, so we, I told you, it's like when I is uh, ice cream. They come in different flavors. This one is stained for a marker that is apoptosis. So this cell actually is committing suicide. The uh, gooey uh, thing in the middle, that color, 
reddish bluish color is actually the stain for an apoptotic cell. So we can go into these cells and get a lot of uh, useful information that we were not able to get before because people couldn't find these intact cells. And uh, this is very powerful. The one hypothesis of uh, how cancer spreads is, comes from Bob Weinberg at MIT. It's called EMT, epithelial to mesenchymal transition. Epithelial cells, as they become sloughed off, they become more mesenchymal, or if they become mesenchymal, they are sloughed off. We don't know exactly. Uh, it's a chicken and egg. But they transition their phenotype from an epithelial to a non-epithelial mesenchymal type. It's called EMT transition. It's been a very controversial topic. It has not been shown in human, but in this uh, patient, there are no antibodies for this. Uh, we used RNA-ish, so we stained the RNA, actually, in this case. And uh, we have used the uh, yellow channel for epithelial markers. And we looked at three markers, all yellow, CK, E-Kettering, and EPCAM. And we used the red M markers, mesenchymal markers. We used PI1, FN1, and N-Kettering, all red. As you look at this, this cell has on the E markers. This cell has both E and M markers, and this cell has M markers. So this is from the same patient. That these cells, uh, uh, you can capture them, find them in different uh, stages of uh, uh, transition from E to M cell. And so that's very interesting because this is what many people believe is the mechanism by which uh, cancer spreads. It's very fundamental information. Yep. Um, I, what do you mean by convincing? I mean, it, it's probably in transition to, towards M. And uh, these are all epithelial cells at the beginning. There are no M cancers. And uh, so, it, uh, so, it, uh, so it is uh, in the case of, uh, this is a breast cancer patient. Uh, no, this is a lung cancer patient. It's an epithelial. This is a non-small cell adenocarcinoma of the lung. It's an epithelial cancer. And uh, here, I think I need to go here. Uh, you'll see a We scan through multiple layers. You can see scattered M and E dots, which means that both markers are being expressed. I won't show you, but we are not counting all these spots in per cell, per patient, and plotting their uh, basically going after what is the transition, does it correl correlate with the behavior of how they respond to treatments, and so on and so forth. So it's lots of exciting information we are trying to uh, learn from this kind of new biology. The other exciting hypothesis of how cancer spreads, uh, an earlier one is that people believe that it's microclusters slough off from the tumor, not individual cells, but two, three, four cells. And it's never been shown, but uh, they will get uh, clogged the microcapillaries and then spread into the tissues. And so it's much more mechanical spreading as opposed to a much more biological chemical uh, transition. And so we actually find these clusters now in circulation. Here you see a differential interference contrast imaging of a cluster of these cells. This is a mega cluster, huge cluster. You see the herringbone pattern, it's stuck there. And, and we do see these clusters in 5 to 10 percent of patients depending on the cell type. And, uh, and here we stained it from a prostate cancer patient to make sure that the cluster has the prostate markers, such as prostate-specific antigen, and it does. And uh, so it is giving us a very powerful way of uh, investigating uh, these cells and understand how cancer spreads. So from a biological perspective, uh, it's quite exciting. And uh, the last point I want to make with images is, again, Ben and Jerry ice cream. Within the same cluster, we see the heterogeneous uh, uh, cell types. So this is a prostate cancer patient. Some cells have only PSA, prostate-specific antigen. Some cells have prostate-specific membrane antigen. Um, I won't go into details of that. That has a very important clinical implications. The ratio of the two in a given patient determines actually how you uh, um, uh, treat some of the patients. So this kind of information you can start gathering after uh, what uh, some thousand years uh, 
uh, since uh, the black bile was first uh, defined. And uh, so from that perspective, it's very exciting. A lot of this is up in the air. We need to do more biology, and we are doing that, and I'll show you a little bit more. But so what do you do with this? We can create beautiful images, and my office is filled with these images, so it's nice. It looks much better than it looked seven, eight years ago. And, uh, but what do you do with it? One application, and probably the first and most uh, generic application, is uh, similar to viral load you will do in an AIDS patient or a bacterial load in a bacterial patient. You're following a patient. If the viral load is high, they're not treat, uh, responding to treatment. If the virus number goes down, they are responding. So you can monitor individually each patient. Equivalent of that is not uh, done in a uh, cancer. First of all, cancer is many different diseases, not one disease. And uh, so this could be a viral load equivalent test. You're looking at the circulating tumor cells. It's the tumor load, and that tells you something whether or not the patient responding. This patient is a prostate cancer patient right there. You see the tumor responds very well. It disappears to adrogen deprivation therapy, Lupron. So you take the hormones out. It's hormone re responsive. It, it, it melts away. And you can see that the circulating tumor cells uh, go down. And we have done this with hundreds and hundreds of patients with all types of different cancers. The correlation is amazingly good within an individual patient. The size of the tumor, number of CTCs don't correlate between patients. But if in a patient you have a cancer, you treat it, and the patient responds, uh, the response is very. So you can individually monitor from a blood uh, test uh, patients and see whether or not they are responding. But this is a little bit of a numb nuts way of using the technology because you're not really getting the info. We have intact cells. We can create all those beautiful images. All we are doing is to count them. Well, you can do other things. One of the things that uh, we have done is we looked at the proliferation of these cells in prostate cancer patients. So the hypothesis there was if more of the cells are proliferating, that should be bad for the patient. If less of the cells are proliferating, it should be good for the patient because it's probably not good to have a lot of proliferating cancer cells in your circulation. And we stained it with Chi-67 again. So three cancer cells two leukocytes, this one is proliferating, the other is not. So we counted in uh, some uh, 20, 30 patients, uh, we counted uh, uh, the behavior of the cells, and we did it in two groups, Can prostate cancer patients to fall into two buckets, castration resistant and castration sensitive. In other words, those sensitive ones respond very well to treatment, resistant ones don't. Turns out to be Castration-sensitive patients almost virtually don't have any proliferating prostate uh, cancer cells in circulation. On the other hand, resistant patients have 50%. So th we have a big clinical trial now going on because this could determine how you treat a patient. So from that information, by having the intact cell, measuring its ability to proliferate, you can make a clinical decision on the treatment. We can go even deeper. That's a cell level information, but we can go and take the nucleic acids from the cell and look at the molecular aspects. Lung cancer is the one that kills most uh, uh, in cancer, both women and men. And uh, non-smokers lung cancer is very common. And uh, about 10% of these patients in this country, about 20% in Asia, respond to a drug called gefitinib. It's a magic drug. You can see the cancer patient here. Look at the lung is occluded with cancer on the hair. Look at it six weeks later. It dissipates. It's gone. And uh, so these patients turn out to be uh, have uh, mutations in their EGFR, epithelial uh, uh, growth factor receptor. If you have those mutations, this targeted drug works like a miracle. But how do you know who has the? It's a lung cancer. You can't do biopsy. It's not easy. And about 50% of these patients in two years will develop resistance. And um, so they, uh, actually a group, uh, uh, my collaborator, Dan Haber, uh, uh, mapped out this in 2004. It's the first targeted therapy in solid cancers. Uh, and there are about eight mut uh, deletion mutations that are very critical in EGFR. And there is one T790M 
which is the resistance gene. Many of them, but those are the most common ones. So the question is, who has those? If you are diagnosed with lung cancer, do you have these mutations? Should you be put on an experimental or a targeted treatment, which is typically a third-line drug, or should you be put on a chemotherapy and radio, uh, radiation therapy? And so that decision can come from these cells if these cells actually mimic what's in the primary tumor. So we have uh, isolated these cells. Uh, in some cases, we did allele-specific PCR. In some cases, we did uh, uh, sequencing uh, if we had enough cells. And the long, uh, to make the long story short, we do find the same mutations in circulating tumor cells. We actually find some activating mutations that are not in the primary tumor that come up during the treatment. And uh, you see one patient here, very powerful uh, results. Uh, what that shows on the here, number of CTCs is a function of treatment. The red line, you see that the patient responds very well. The cells disappear. About 200 days later, the uh, circuit in tumor cells, your viral load, so to speak, comes back. So the patient is not responding. And we also looked at the uh, EGFR and T790M. At the beginning, we had the, this patient had the deletion mutation, so it should respond to treatment, and it did. At day 200, it expressed the T790 resistance gene, stopped responding to treatment. So that's when you go to an experimental drug. So you can first time monitor the genotypic uh, behavior uh, of the uh, cancer from a blood test uh, in a single patient uh, longitudinally, as well as the number of tumor cells shed into circulation. So we have a, a number of diseases. This is very important because the targeted drug uh, market is about uh, $35 billion. It's, uh, and, uh, Today, every cancer patient in their life cycle of treatment will be treated by one targeted drug. So companion diagnostic is very important. Who, even if it is one person of the population, you need to look at the diagnosed 100 person of the population to decide who should be on targeted treatment. So all the pharmaceutical companies are now going into and building their diagnostic arm to be able to uh, monitor targeted therapies. So it is very critical for targeted therapy. And the only eight drugs that are in the pipeline in cancer, they're all targeted uh, uh, therapies. So it is really the future of cancer treatment and ability to monitor like this is very critical. This is probably the most exciting but the smallest scale study we have done. And uh, early detection, we, couldn't, we don't think the technology is sensitive enough for early detection, and, uh, but we had to try it. Uh, these are prostate cancer patients, clinically they are localized uh, 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 cancer. So clinically for the last 100 years, Gleason stage 6, 7, these patients are localized. In other words, it's within the membrane of the prostate. It has not spread beyond uh, to lymph nodes and beyond. And uh, these patients in the United States, are uh, prostate is surgically removed as a treatment before surgery, high prostate specific antigen, two days SA is PSA in serum. After surgery, you take their prostate out, it goes to zero, as you expect. There's no difference. These, all these patients behave the same. When we looked at their circulating tumor cell, they fell into three buckets. One, as you expect in a localized cancer, there's no circulating tumor cell. So that's the one bucket. So there's no vascular invasion. The middle one, they were a large number of circulating tumor cells. As soon as we removed the prostate, they disappeared within a day. So we believe this is early vascular invasion, and then you remove the prostate, it disappears. The third bucket, which is the most interesting, is some cells lingered around for months. In this case, I believe nine days. And uh, for months, we found these cells. And if the half-life of these cells is about a day, why are they in there? Prostate cancer goes to bone marrow. We believe those have metastatic nodules in the bone marrow. So we have a large clinical trial for two years. Uh, we are uh, following these patients to see if it correlates with the behavior. If you are Swedish, and I think you are Swedish, right? No. No. Okay. If you are Swedish and you have this disease in Sweden, they won't touch you. If you are American or you're living here, you have this disease, before you move out, get out of the hospital, you, you left your prostate there. It's gone, it's removed. So to advanced country, great medicine, 
totally different. Uh, so we believe that uh, these are the ones we shouldn't probably operate here. And Swedish should probably should operate on this population of patients, and we fight over the middle portion. They don't operate, and we operate. But it could be that how you stratify a patient from this kind of information is very important. So that's one of the other applications we are exploring. Yes? It could be that there's uh, small micrometastatic nodules, and they slough off, uh, and then finally there are no more cells, or they go to into, uh, they, you know, they're not vascular uh, anymore, and then it just stops. That it was there all the time, no. no. But we are uh, doing a clinical trial where we do bone marrow biopsies to go with this, to, because it's not an easy hypothesis to test. And so these are the type of clinical applications that we are exploring. We are also developing animal models. I won't go into too much of the details uh, other than to say this is an endogenous pancreatic model. So it is not a tumor, human tumor put into a mouse. Actually, this mouse has a pancreas cancer uh, by knocking out two of the genes. You could do that very well defined. And um, we do cardiac puncture, kill the animal, get all the blood. Now we are sampling the entire blood volume. That's very uh, important. And we find very large number of these cells. In fact, we also find clusters uh, in the, uh, these animal models. That's very important because now we can do some of the molecular things we couldn't do with humans. So we have done gene expression analysis of these cells with primary tumor. What happens is uh, in the pancreas, can all cancers, as the, soon as the cells are detached from the epithelial layer, uh, they go into committed suicide. A portion of them somehow survive. Are there genes that they harbor that the cells in the primary tumor don't have that make them resistant to uh, dying when they are in a suspended state, cells that are supposed to die? So with gene expression, we looked at primary tumor, metaecites, and also the CHIP. And in CHIP, we did a negative control, just IgG, so that we can extract the information from nonspecific blood cells. Make the long story short, um, there were about 1,000 candidate genes that were different between the IgG chip and the uh, uh, specific uh, capture chip. Of those, there were about 300 some that were absent in normal blood. Of those, uh, 37 of them were uh, present ascites because that's how can pancreas cancer spreads, blood and uh, peritoneal, and absent in tumor. One of them went to. Uh, it was very interesting because WIN2 confers resistance. Uh, it forms, uh, 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 overexpresses fibronectin in cells and forms uh, spheroids, and cells actually resist uh, uh, dying when they have that expression. And surely in CTCs we find WIN2. Then we immediately went to human and we found these cells exactly the same way. About uh, half of the patient's uh, cells had. Uh, uh, went to uh, signaling with RNA-ish uh, staining. And they had also these cells in the circulation. So the, uh, this kind of tool, we can also go to mass models, learn, uh, do expression profile, learn from it, and then look in the human models, things that you couldn't do otherwise. And so that we can uh, develop uh, therapeutic targets. And uh, the mechanism that's emerging uh, uh, in, from this is primary tumor CTCs are released. WIN2 signal makes them resistant. That also expresses fibronectin, makes them resistant to another Greek word, uh, anoikis, which is uh, when cells are detached from the surface, they die. And, and that's how they survive. So we are, uh, and then you can turn on and off these signals uh, with various drugs. So that's why it's so important. What we are up to now is we are scaling this up uh, to uh, for a very large clinical trial at uh, four clinical centers, uh, uh, MD Anderson, Sloan Catering, Dana-Farber, and Mass General Hospital. So we have gone from the chips that we make in our lab to uh, plastic chip manufacturing outsource. But we are doing all of this. And, uh, and so we did a cyclic olefin chip. We can scale this up. We can provide the chip to our collaborators. It's actually Marty. Uh, Fleischer at uh, Sloan Catering. 
and uh, funded by Hollywood, believe it or not, uh, uh, Stand Up to Cancer Organization. They gave us a, a very large sum of money to take this technology in the hands of others and validate it truly because in one center with our expert hands, uh, with all the postdocs and students who are really good at this stuff is uh, different than actually put it in the hands of others. So we have automated the processor, automated the imaging. We have weekly group meetings, uh, uh, telecommunication meetings. We provide the chips. We do every, everything, and they run with their patients. And the results so far are good. Uh, we started in April, so it's been a few months. Uh, not April. When did we start? Uh, I think, yeah, it's been six months. And um, so the excitement for this uh, from black bile to CT says you can monitor treatment you can use it for targeted therapy it's blood biopsy you get molecular genetic information from a blood sample you can do early detection learn about the biology and uh, do biomarker discovery and we are exploring each one of the, uh, these uh, various areas as much as we can as we move forward we do have generation three four five technologies in the pipeline but we lack this technology so we can do clinical trials uh, with one technology. But I can tell you that it's not good enough. We need, especially for early detection, the technology needs to have much higher sensitivity. It needs to process more blood. And uh, so we, we are developing those technologies as well. And um, it's uh, not a collaboration. This kind of thing uh, is very difficult to do through collaboration. Uh, it's actually Dan Haber, who's the director of Cancer Center, and uh, uh, my group, we merge our laboratories. And uh, so it, uh, when I say we merge our laboratories, uh, that means the financial hiring, all the decisions are given together. When it's a collaboration, collaborator is the students, they have their papers, we have, you know, it's not like that. Whatever is important, that's where we put the funds. Wherever the problem is, that's what we use the funds to solve the problem. We hire, fire, and uh, together. So it is uh, really uh, uh, much beyond collaboration at this stage. And it's a pretty large group with lots of clinicians, pathologists, engineers having fun. Thank you so much. All right. Thank, All right. thank you very much. Yeah. Any questions? So with your uh, mouse model, you showed the gene expression. And I was, I was wondering if you capture as many leukocytes with the mouse shift, and if you do, how do you discriminate the, the gene expression? It turns out to be the locked up. In the mouse model, the purity was very high. Somehow, mouse leukocytes uh, uh, don't uh, stick not specifically to, uh, they are much more respectful to parties they are not invited to than humans. <laughs> And uh, so if we lack that. In humans, we couldn't do that study because our purity could be anywhere 0.1% in a good day, 5 10%. In an excellent day, sometimes we get much better, but very low. It's a chapter in expression profile. In mass, it's more Do you have enough cells on in that CTCs to isolate and then grow them like in a yeah, the whole, that's the holy grail, yes. Uh, we do not. Uh, we are working on it. We have special media we are getting from all over the world. Uh, people have developed it. We are developing our media, our conditions. Uh, we have not been, uh, uh, we haven't been able to successfully grow these cells. The technologies that I showed, the cells are stuck on the surface. We need a technology where the cells are in a tube, a vial in a tube so we can put them in calcium. So the, our third generation technology does that. But we have not been able to do that. It is really the, where we want to be. So uh, in your second generation chip that's uh, made of COC, I was wondering how are you, uh, are you doing any modif surface modification to attach the antibodies to, how is that done? Right, it's, uh, the surface is, uh, it's silane chemistry. So surface is activated and then we do a cross-linker nutravidin. We actually give nutravidin chips to our uh, collaborators. We give them the antibody of choice, but it's uh, flexible. If they want to swap with other antibodies, they could do it. I saw some work where they separate yeast. Yeah, yeah. Uh, using microfluidic approach, and the idea was complete perfusion of your blood. So 
So we well, uh, capturing these guys. Yeah, uh, yeast infections, candida and others, are extremely important. Most of the hospital infections uh, are, uh, uh, it's a major killer. And if you don't diagnose it within the first 24 hours, um, the mortality goes up significantly, up to 30, uh, 40 percent in the best hospitals. And so the ability to actually, we are working on it too, um, take a blood sample and isolate these very rapidly and then identify is uh, very important. What you are saying is more like a therapeutic dialysis, right. uh, where uh, you will take the whole blood, put it through, throw away yeast or any unwanted uh, particulate material that's in blood, whether it's virus, uh, to I'm happy we can process 10 milliliter of blood. Uh, five liter of blood in one hour, uh, it uh, defies all my imaginary capacity. <laughs> but, <laughs> and uh, we talk about it. There's not huge interest among clinicians because uh, if there are all these metastatic sites, uh, you really need to uh, use uh, uh, other therapeutic regimens. Uh, the other thing is, if dialysis was invented today, it will never become a reality. It's the biggest cost on uh, healthcare, uh, dialysis. There is no way, at the time it was uh, invented, the cost of healthcare wasn't like this, and, it, uh, and today they cannot take it away. I don't think there will be any dialysis of tumors where the uh, reimbursements will pay for it. Dialysis is about the $300 billion cost to American uh, taxpayers. So it will be probably unlikely. So, I'm a device person, so I bring you back to the device technology. Where do you think the bottlenecks are and the challenges are for those who don't have access to medical researchers that they can contribute to our discipline? I, from a, a sensitivity is very important, and uh, multifactorial separation is very important. I would not go into single or oh, its size or its uh, a surface charge type thing. If, and, uh, but if you could do multi, uh, mm -hmm. ability to work in whole blood is very important. I would say uh, it, many of the ideas that look very cool and exciting in with beads and microliters and uh, well, my advice would be work with real systems you don't need to have really medical collaborators right. you could buy blood right. and it's not that difficult but i would work with because we do very we do a little bit cell lines even cell lines is very difficult to translate to actual patient samples so and you can get patient sample uh, from any local hospital yeah you have to do irb and a little bit of that I think working with real systems, with the real design parameters, whole blood, looking into sensitivity, throughput. If you can invent with some uh, very high throughput device, you could also do a therapeutic uh, type thing, or you could say, as an experimental system, if you can interrogate the whole body. And uh, in vivo, if you could do this in vivo, where you actually more optical. So you don't have to take blood, but you give something that labels the cells in vivo, and then either from the eye uh, or uh, or other uh, blood uh, search, perfusion blood vessels, you can monitor and count these things. The biggest impact, in my view, will be uh, in uh, targeted therapies as companion diagnostics. That will probably be uh, a device of this sort, maybe not this, but in, in vitro biological assay. In the long run, early detection may have to be in situ, in vivo detection scheme. Mm -hmm. And uh, because uh, if these cells, we want to catch a very, so either implantable mm -hmm. or some optical thing that you label the cells and you can monitor it. And uh, so those are the areas where, and you need to think about the cost as well. If your device is gonna cost anything more than $100, yeah. it's not gonna, I mean, you can, uh, but ultimately, even the silicon chip, which was $500, if we were to scale it up, it was going to come down to $20, $30. Plastic chip is the cost of antibody. Plastic is not. So I noticed in the, in the post chip, it seemed like a lot of the cells tended to stick on the leading edge where maybe you have a little less flow shear. On the post. Is yeah, that maybe in the, those images. Actually, we have analyzed it. We have a paper that's coming out soon. And uh, that is not the case, actually. They do 
uh, and we have another technology where we made the posts from a porous, uh, vertically aligned uh, uh, nanotubes. And the idea there was uh, if the fluid flow can be biased, but not particles, uh, so these are about 80 nanometer uh, apart, 8 nanometer vertical nanotubes. So have the fluid, so the boundary layer will be such that the cells will get closer to the surface. And it worked beautifully, actually. We got orders of magnitude improvement in capture efficiency. In that technology, they were mostly at the top surface. And, uh, but in the one solid post, uh, statistically, it was all uh, distributed there. Could you say a little bit about the, the imaging platform that you use? The, the one that I showed, it's just fluorescence imaging, and uh, we uh, have uh, an experimental system that's high-end research microscope, but we also uh, work with a company called BioView, and uh, they have a scanning system and, uh, where uh, it takes about a few hours to scan each chip at seven layers because it's a little bit three-dimensional, and uh, but we can... Um, archive every digital image, you know, every location of the images. We have all the target uh, cells uh, uh, digitally sent to the pathologist uh, and for them to review. Physically, you can find, if you see a cell and you really want to go to that location, you can physically still find that cell. And uh, right now, we are going to another imaging platform, uh, which is multispectral imaging. We are limited with three, four channels with the standard fluorescence microscopy. You have too much bleed, uh, cross bleeding. Mm -hmm. With multispectral imaging for each color, you look at the whole spectrum for each marker, and you can actually unmix that. So we have up to 13 colors now. And uh, so those are type of things because we don't know what these cells are. We want to put, if we put Chi 67 there, we have to take out another marker from here, yeah. and we don't want to do that. We want to have a multiplex it. So, uh, multispectral imaging is where we are uh, going. Uh, How long do the cells live in the chip? If you put them in, uh, typically we capture them and fix them. Uh -huh. and, and then stain them for imaging oh, purposes see, okay. or fix it and then isolate nucleic acids. If you want to culture them, as uh, 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 you mentioned, uh, then they, we don't know. We have kept them in culture days, they uh -huh. survived, but we were not able to proliferate. So once you stain them, you can go to, your imaging takes five days, your imaging takes five days. But it clinically, it's, uh, it right. makes it, uh, it's not feasible. It yeah. needs to be within two or three hours max per slide. Yeah. Beyond that... Uh, but from a research point of view, you can figure it, you can take some time to figure it out, sure. and then once you figure it out... When we published our first paper in uh -huh. 2007, it took us two weeks to do each chip. <laughs> now it's two hours. Yeah. So you said that the purity of the human cells was does that mean that you're capturing other types of cells? Leukocytes, white blood cells stick to the surface. Our first chip, we had great purity. And uh, we, did, we you know, live and learn. The god died. <coughs> that was the worst funeral we attended. <laughs> and uh, we have never been able to find an antibody that worked as good as that one. Now, whenever we have an antibody, and we have many different antibodies, uh, molecules, we find it. We, spend close to half a million plus to buy everything and put it on the site. Because we, yeah, I mean, this is very expensive to be able to reproduce. And antibody works, we buy the gods, we buy the houses, <laughs> we, have, we have the Christmas presents ready already. I'm telling you, it, it is expensive. My teenager son is cheaper. Not a lot. I know, he's asking for that car. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, let's thank the speaker again.